globes. Um, is, it's at once difficult uh, because you have to work on a three-dimensional surface and you can't just make sketches, so you have to imagine the whole thing. Mm. And working on computers with globes is even more difficult because again, it's a 2D surface, but it has to play out in the third dimension. Mm. And so there are mathematical and projection issues. And, but that's also again why globes are interesting because globes don't distort. Okay. Any map of the world distorts automatically and there's even a globe that shows how many different distortion possibilities there are depending on the kind of need you have and that's what we have for instance the Mercator map that is very famous because it allowed navigators to go in one direction and to plot an actual curved line plot it directly and a straight line on the map and it turned out to be also a straight line on the globe that is our Mercator mm -hmm. except for also being a great globe maker uh, became sort of very well known and his maps were very very useful at the time mm. even though of course they overrepresented the northern uh, areas as opposed mm -hmm. to the equatorial areas but that's just one thing um, the other thing about the globe is that it's um, it's an instrument that's really old except the last or the 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 earliest sample of an earth representing globes because there are many globes that represented the spheres or the or cosmological um, um, imagination but to think that the um, or that that globes were used for not exactly navigation but for understanding the world that goes back uh, a few hundred years uh, and the the earliest existing still existing globe is one that was made in 1492 by a, a geographer uh, that was working for the Portuguese at that time, uh, Martin Behan, mm. originally coming, I think, from uh, what's today uh, the Czech Republic era. And, uh, and he made a globe uh, that was there, it was really an information piece, was there to show how, you know, where everything was on the earth and how to find trade routes and how to find shorter trade routes. And that was supposed to convince some uh, traders in uh, the trading town of Nuremberg to, uh, to finance an expedition. Wow. Ironically, at the mm -hmm. same time, in 1492, the first, uh, you know, the first news also arrived of America. Actually, it didn't arrive because I think Columbus was in, in America in 1492, but it took him quite a while to come back. So even though the discovery was made, nobody knew that the discovery had been made. And the first globe that we today have mm -hmm. of, as a world globe exactly made in the same year that Columbus wow. discovered America and yet America is not on that globe except you have a very prominent Japan in a position but not in the shape oh, yeah. of today's Japan so anyway the globe has then undergone a lot of uh, iterations and um, but it's also been a very constant medium um, and especially in that size that sort of 12 inches or 30 centimeters diameter and what's interesting about that one I thought in, and that's what I've seen in interactions with audiences that they walk in and that they almost feel as if the globe is something anthropomorphic, something similar to them. So like their own head and the size of the globe, there's mm -hmm. some kind of uh, like parallel and uh, there seems to be some kind of communication going on. Mm -hmm. And they work really well as, uh, as vectors. Because other, let's say you have a map you set in front of a wall you can point to it and then you have to talk to the person next to you, but here you have one person on one side and on the other side. You look at the other person and the other side, what do you see, but I don't see. And, and, it, and it's really a conversation piece, which is also the way that we're used uh, in the 17th, 18th and 19th century. And I just discovered that because there was this uh, this thing about globes that I thought was very individual. I thought globes were kind of nice. And there was some, some unspoken beauty about them, uh, regardless of what they showed, and they were nicer and not so nice globes, but mostly everybody seems to like globes. I mean, most people like maps, most people mm -hmm. like old maps, and I have yet to meet one person that doesn't like globes. It's a very strange platform that you seem to be able to use to convey just about any kind of content. So people will look at something that's round, mm -hmm. that's colorful, that's illuminated on top of it, it will just draw people's attention. 
it's an ideal medium. It's a good channel. It just goes in relatively easily, uh, even though a lot of people have complained about, you know, well, these are such nice looking globes and then you look closer and then you see all the horror that goes on in the world, all the issues. But then again, that's like the nature of news, um, that not that I'm mapping out news events, but um, that the issues that we're interested in are problematic. It doesn't represent everything. It represents the totality. So you can't just say, okay, I'll make a globe about the interrelationships of trade and commerce and uh, communication in Europe. That's not a globe, because then you leave everything else untouched. So to make a thematic globe, you have to have information about what is going on everywhere on Earth. And you need to pretty much have data for every country, if you do it country by country or region by region, but you have to have the synoptic view. And that makes it very interesting and challenging. Most of the subjects come or are triggered by either a sudden availability of data that was not available before or by something that happens uh, um, internationally at a subject in the news or some other interests and then um, you wonder what does it look like in other parts of the world, what is the proportion, the scale or dimension of this, this issue. Mm -hmm. And then I'm trying to do my research and uh, then we are making these globes. I think to visualize always, uh, I mean they always say like a picture is worth a thousand words. So that's something that's interesting because it's efficient and it's fast mm -hmm. and you can grasp a lot of contents and you can you you don't necessarily get the details but you get the big picture and that's the important thing so um, the way I try to see it is if um, and what I typically would do have an exhibition with not just one globe but have like 10 20 30 mm -hmm. with up to like a hundred and even though that's maybe a little bit much but if you have like 30 40 uh, 60 globes people look globe by globe by globe and then they go back. And then after a while, they have like topic by topic by topic. And, and, and very rarely, there are two topics covered in one globe. So normally, it just states what the situation is. And then it's kind of the question in the, in the audience's mind, like, how does this all relate? It's all happening in the same place at the same time or over a certain time. And, and what is the interrelationship? How does one thing condition the other? Uh, how do they start seeing patterns? But I want this to be a process to happen inside the audience. Mm. So if somebody observes something, they should really own their own discovery. Mm -hmm. So I'm just presenting the data as, as intuitively accessible as possible. Mm. That's my, my, my goal. So it's kind of a journalistic goal to represent, mm. you know, without any fear or favor, um, what is, uh, what's there. I never put like two red globes next to each other. Okay. And I want to, some people to confuse them and uh, to just get a, get a visually balanced field. Mm -hmm. But otherwise it's totally random. Mm. And the randomness I think is important because there is really no, un, un, unless you want to lead somebody, unless you want to make an argument, which I really don't want to make, I want people to be able to, to draw on their own memory of these globes onto information that they have perceived and that becomes sort of or is distilled into an icon and is, and is memorable as an icon that that becomes almost like a, like a key on the piano that you can play with mm -hmm. in your head mm -hmm. and then you can bring up all these as arguments or as supports or something that you know uh, perhaps also just illustrates that perspective to look at issues in a global manner mm -hmm. and not just as a local phenomenon Look at the context. That was the interesting thing. The first time that uh, I attended a meeting uh, in Philadelphia a few years back, uh, it took me a while to understand what what the what the subject actually was. How how information science was trying to look at information science. So this was like a very 
um, um, uh, solipsistic mm -hmm. uh, perspective uh, that just at one point I kind of got it, uh, or I think I did, and and realized that yeah, this is like another universe that's trying to understand it itself, and uh, like a globe, it is I'm not sure if it's already mapped out, but a globe is interesting because it, it like as a map is always view um, like a one particular perspective on an issue but it it always chooses a perspective and you have to choose a f certain framing the mm -hmm. Arctic perspective or equatorial or you have XYZ country in the in the center I mean that's always here that maps uh, like Chinese maps always have China mm -hmm. in the center and they look totally different from the maps that we are used to mm -hmm. I know from growing up in Europe unless I see Africa on the map I go like this is not a world map, and it takes a second to realize, oh yeah, it's America in the middle. It's, mm -hmm. it's just another perspective. But this became interesting because it's this, it, it, it is a universe, like like the world or like the globe is, and why not showing it, uh, show the complexity in 3D as opposed to a map? Mm -hmm. Because a map also clearly didn't do the subject matter justice. It seemed that there were a lot of connections that would, you know, not really play out on a, on, a, on a map because things that, and that's the beauty of a globe again, is that things that can be really far away, but they can, from one point of view, right. on the other point of view, they're very close. Over here. And, yeah. and, and this kind of warping in another dimension was something that I thought would really do uh, very, very well. And I, th I suggested that, and uh, I think, um, I mean, that, that, that thought must have come across. Uh, the the uh, those uh, the originators of these maps mm -hmm. uh, before, but I think it helped that I probably said that I think that can be done, and I'd be interested in working on that. So I um, if it, it took a few years to actually figure out a way of looking at the three dimensional space, mm -hmm. and then make that into uh, again into a two dimensional space that then can be projected onto a sphere. Mm -hmm. So it's an approximation like we see here. And it's it's far from perfect, but then again, at that scale, and normally on an Earth terms, that scale of one to forty million, mm -hmm. at that scale, it's pretty good. Science on the sphere is interesting because uh, it's it's a new tool, relatively new tool. It's only a few years old. Mm -hmm. There. Are, um, there are only a few of them available right now in other countries. Uh, they have slightly different systems. And and uh, a, few, a few years back, I was commissioned by the uh, um, by the Japanese. Uh, um, it was the museum they call Miraikan. That's sort of a nickname for the uh, museum for um, innovation and emerging sciences, uh, based in Tokyo. Um, that museum, as its icon, has in its in one of its areas, so almost spread over like four stories, in this huge space has this uh, uh, twenty-foot illuminated, but really more like a like a movie screen that is illuminated by uh, LEDs. So and this can show all kinds of uh, uh, kinds of data. And in two thousand and ten, um, it was rebuilt into a very high resolution display. Very similar to science on the sphere, except higher resolution and larger. And uh, so I started making uh, certain content and uh, movies actually for this spherical display. Now that was something that I've never done before, and you create a cr you're kind of creating something, or you you're doing something for a, for a platform that didn't exist before. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, of course you can wrap things back around that were taken from sphere so the standard accurate distance uh, or accurate tangle projection that can be mapped back there so any grid pattern is easy to map mm -hmm. and a regular world map is easy to map but once once you have things that move on a map then they change radically mm -hmm. and things that change you know if you move something from the um, equator to uh, to the poles they on the map they have to make them a lot bigger because otherwise the at the pole, everything shrinks down to like zero. Right. So to right. account for these uh, projection issues, uh, a lot of math had to be reapplied, not, not exactly reinvented, but had to be reapplied 
and, and to have a workflow that actually made it possible to create a movie that mm -hmm. plays back as if it was always there. Yeah. It was made for that. So uh, that was um, a huge task and it was completed a few years later and it's now playing there on a, on a daily basis. Yeah. And, and, and SOS or the Science on the Sphere is, has a slightly different um, way of presenting the data but the I think the idea and the concept is just the same. Mm -hmm. That you don't have a distortion and that you have a sphere on which you can display ideally global data. And um, so that's, uh, so, so th this week we're exchanging uh, sort of learning experiences with the different uh, media or the different tools if you want. The exhibit followed uh, this, I think it was like, yeah, this meeting in Philadelphia mm -hmm. and uh, I, I got so interested in the subject matter that I was uh, I was trying to contribute something to that uh, because it was kind of right down by my alley, so to speak, and um, especially because I'd, I'd already the, at that time made uh, uh, or tried to map out uh, knowledge where I use a patent database uh, that became publicly accessible, right. and uh, to map out the zones of invention again. That was uh, another piece of research that MIT had done and, and I could fuse all that into one globe where I say uh, this is where it, this is where intellectual property is being produced, that is where it's being held and so forth. So that was an interesting thing to map out and uh, it, it did fit within the exhibition. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, and as, as it is with information in general, uh, every few years uh, that information needs to be updated and mm -hmm. that's what been doing ever since. Mm -hmm. And also reformatting it as it becomes sometimes more detailed and as the tools are getting better one can put another layer and yet another layer of information in it so that at first sight it looks like oh it just shows one topic but then you see it shows the same topic from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. So this it became more dense over the last six years. And then again in the context of this exhibition that is all about maybe the structuring of information and the visualization and how to use visualization to structure information and to make information accessible, that became uh, an interesting topic. And in some sense, um, one of the approaches really puzzled me initially because it assumed that, it, that authors, that individuals, kind of own that information when they're creating it and they kind of represent that information and that they as a person stand for that information or to say that invention right. because they're the patent holders or they're the author of the paper and so forth. So then that you can have what I was thought was neutral information or the body of mankind's knowledge. Now this knowledge is actually embodied, physically embodied in these people at, at the time when they're inventing it. And I found that very interesting that this is uh, almost goes back to a notion of the master, of uh, somebody who really knows his craft or mm -hmm. his, uh, his sphere of, uh, of knowledge. And um, from my many visits and encounters with the Japanese culture, I understood that that is also how the Japanese society as a culture structures and, and preserves information as, there, as there's always one person that is considered by pr pretty much everybody to be at the top of his game and at the top of his field. Mm. And that person, through this person, all new information has to go. And he has to, almost like a clearinghouse, has to accept it and then make it part of his body of knowledge. And then this person stands there as a representative. So, mm. so that was something that I have, I've actually, through Places and Spaces uh, exhibition, became more aware of in terms of the structuring of, uh, of also cultural knowledge right. and, the, and, the, and the personal embodiment of information, which is almost antithetical to what I thought our sort of modern times uh, represent, where information is stored on hard drives and books and whatnot, and where it's sort of 
non-personal, where, mm -hmm. where, where, all this, where, where all science wants to be interpersonal and objective. Mm -hmm. But it is a subject and a subjective perspective that is embodying and that is uh, the authority in the end. Mm -hmm. So we still need that for information to be knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I think that is also the message of that exhibition, that, that even though it's all about information and knowledge, but it is actually the human mm -hmm. that represents it and that has to structure it and, uh, and, and embody mm -hmm. that knowledge.